Welcome to the Ambassadorial Series. I'm Jill Doherty. Probably no Americans have as unique and in-depth perspectives on Russia as United States ambassadors. They arrive at their posts in Moscow often with deep knowledge of the country and its language. They live in Russia. They meet and negotiate with the highest Russian officials. They travel throughout the country, interact with Russian citizens. They not only are eyewitnesses to Russia's history, but actors in that history. In the ambassadorial series, we hear from all the living U.S. ambassadors to modern Russia and to the Soviet Union before it. They recount their personal experiences in Moscow, the people they met, the challenges and even dangers they sometimes faced. And with the benefit of time to ponder these experiences, they tell us how they understand Russia, its relationship with the United States, and the impact that relationship has on the world. The Russian uh, approach to its existence is always predicated on the fact that it's huge. Governing it is tremendously difficult. Uh, it has no natural borders. Uh, managing its economy and its resources is always a challenge because it has fewer people than it has resources. And so how do you deal with that? Um, how do you develop its, its people and its, its resources in anything like um, a modern way? Ambassador James Collins studied Russian history at Moscow State University and taught Russian history at the U.S. Naval Academy. And his sense of history has shaped his understanding of this country and its long heritage. But for James Collins, there were moments in Moscow when there was no time for him to think of history. The moment was now. One of the most dramatic events occurred when he was deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, six years before he became ambassador. It was August 1991, the coup against Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev. Ambassador James Collins, thank you very much for being with us. It's really a pleasure. You know, we've spoken so many times in Washington and Moscow and other places, so it's wonderful to be able to talk with you. Well, it's great to be here, Jill, and it's terrific to do it with you. Um, we've had many different experiences together, all of them enlightening and enriching. Thank you. I feel the same. And, you know, as I was thinking about your career, um, you were really, and you have been up to this point, you're very actively engaged in what's going on, but you had that unique vi vision of Russia and the former Soviet Union, but especially that time, kind of post-Soviet, the birth of a new Russia. Um, you were in the mid-90s, you were ambassador at large and special advisor to the Secretary of State for the newly independent states, as they were called at the time. Then from 90 to 93, you were DCM, Deputy Chief of Mission, and Chargé d'Affaires at the uh, embassy in Moscow. And then when we were, our paths crossed in Moscow, 1997 to 2001, you came back as the ambassador. So three postings in Moscow. And going back to that early one when you were DCM, you were DCM right during the dramatic events of the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, you know, I remember myself and certainly many other people were really shocked by that, that it finally was falling apart. Were you shocked? Did you did you see any indication that it was crumbling at that point? And do you have any particularly vivid memories of that period? Well, uh, it was hard to live through it without some pretty vivid memories, of course. I would say, first of all, that I don't think anyone I knew expected the collapse and disintegration of the Soviet Union. When I went out as uh, the ambassador's deputy in the fall of 1990 or end of summer, the collective wisdom of the intelligence community here that I received in my briefings was that within five years, one of the Baltic state republics would attain a substantial degree of autonomy. And a year later, there was no Soviet Union. 
Now, I think that probably reflects reality. Uh, nobody, for reasons that are in retrospect rather surprising, expected the disintegration of the union. Now, that didn't mean that the union hadn't changed a lot and become a very different place under President Gorbachev from what it had been in the earlier times I'd been there in the mid 60s or the early 70s. It was a very different country and it was changing rapidly. There was no question that there was change going on. But as I arrived in 1990, I don't think anyone expected it. And frankly, when the coup against Gorbachev happened in August 1991, it was a surprise to everybody. It wasn't that we hadn't heard rumors of coup plotting and this kind of thing for months. We had. But you kept hearing them to the point when it was the cried wolf story. You know, nobody really had a sense that this was real. And so when it happened, it was a shock and it was a surprise. It also wasn't the end of the Soviet Union, by the way. It took another few months. But the coup was a surprise and a shock. And what happened as the coup collapsed and as Mr. President Gorbachev came back uh, was a series of rapid changes that really did spell what I would say was the end of the Soviet Union as anybody knew it. And the most singular move, I suppose, was the end of the Communist Party as the ruling party or even a party with any privileged position in the country as a whole. And without the Communist Party, it was no longer the Soviet Union, frankly. So, I mean, I think that was, the coup was the shock. It was a moment you uh, could hardly understand or, or fathom at the moment. And my wife made one observation about it all in a book she's written uh, about our years in Moscow where she said, when you're in history, you don't know what comes next. You don't know how it comes out. When you're a historian reading history, you already know the end. So it's a very different perspective. And I have to say that in those days, those three days of the coup, there was great uncertainty about what the future held. Were we going to go back to the Cold War and a hardline communist rule in the Kremlin, or was something else coming? And of course, something else came. I mean, essentially what came was the end of the Soviet system. And I think, you know, was it a shock? Yes, it was a shock and nobody expected it. And it caused great uncertainties about what was, what was coming next, but it was a fact. And I think, uh, the other point I would make is that the United States it did a very good job under Presidents Bush and uh, Secretary Baker in managing that transition without upsetting the apple cart or causing greater uncertainties, much less bloodshed than might have occurred. And I think uh, history is going to show that that was an extremely well managed diplomacy at a time of great uncertainty and great danger when the other nuclear power was coming apart and nobody actually knew what was coming. Yes, in fact, I, I remember that very well. And the fears were monumental, you know, that the country would fall apart loose nukes would be all over the so former Soviet Union. There could be a civil war, there would be bloodshed, there could be nuclear problems, et cetera. It was, it was a very frightening time. How did you, how did you, what did you advise Washington? What were you telling them at that time? Well, I said, one of the things about the coup itself that was interesting is that it took place, of course, early in the morning in, in, uh, in Moscow, which meant everybody was asleep in Washington. And so for several hours, the, the embassy and, and I were basically alone. Uh, we had called our watch officers in Washington, let them know what was happening, but we didn't have any guidance. 
So I said that that was one of the very few times that as a foreign service officer, okay, I was in charge of the embassy at that point. I actually made a decision without anybody uh, telling me how the guidance should be implemented or whatever. And it was that we didn't see it appropriate for the official representation of the United States to have anything to do with the people who had simply proclaimed themselves new rulers. Uh, we had not heard from President Gorbachev. We had not heard anything that suggested that what was being done in the name of constitutional order in the Soviet Union had any legal basis. And so uh, with my colleagues at the embassy for whom I have the greatest respect in terms of how they helped me make the decisions, we basically said, unless it affects the security and safety of American citizens or their property, we will have nothing to do with the people who were proclaiming themselves the masters of the Kremlin. And that basically was policy, at least as I made it for several hours before anybody in Washington decided they had to make a decision about this. And in the end, uh, the, the decision that we made was, I suppose, simply accepted as the way they should move. They should be very cautious, not accept or recognize any new government until they knew what the realities were about uh, who was in charge or who was not, and what was right and what was legal and so forth. At the same time, you know, we had uh, on that same day and in those same hours, Mr. Yeltsin proclaiming that he was standing behind the constitutional order and President Gorbachev, that he did not recognize these folks in the Kremlin as his authority and that he was not taking any orders from them and set himself up as an alternative authority, right half a block away in the so-called Russian White House. And he too, I guess, took my position, you know, that he was not having anything to do with uh, these new self-proclaimed leaders. And so we ended up sort of in tandem on the same side in support of what we both were claiming was the constitutional order and refusing to accept the idea that it was usurped by the people just proclaiming themselves leaders in the Kremlin. And that itself, of course, had a different, had, had its implications. And I think it was around two o'clock in the afternoon, I was asked to come over and receive a message from President Yeltsin at that time. That was also a fairly exciting time because we were inside the barricades there were crowds of people, uh, and I, when I went in the car to the White House with the flag, I didn't know whether they were going to throw rocks or cheer. Well, they cheered. But in essence, uh, the message was uh, asking Washington not to recognize these self-proclaimed uh, authorities and to stay with the constitutional order and support the rule of law and President Gorbachev. And so, uh, you know, that was where we ended up. And when I came back, I had a call from President Bush, who said, well, he hoped we were well and that we were safe. And what did I think? And I, I think the words I most remember was telling him, there are many reasons that it's not at all clear this coup is going to succeed and that we should be very careful and not jump to any conclusions or recognition. And we didn't. And I think history was on our side or we were on the side of history, but also we were on the right side. That is true. Yeah, what a dramatic moment. You know, we mentioned President Bush, and this of course is Herbert Walker Bush, uh, the father. And that period, later, I think, has been interpreted as the United States caused the end of the Soviet Union because uh, the United States outspent Russia on weaponry, etc. But looking at President Bush and the way he handled it, and obviously with uh, consultation with you, 
there was no triumphalism, at least as far as I can see, on the part of the Bush administration. And in fact, they went out of their way not to say, rub it in, but to really be supportive. And uh, how do you see that period? Because there is such, um, to this day, misinterpretation or overinterpretation of the Americans' role uh, in what happened in the former Soviet Union. Well, I, th I think in a very general sense, there is no question that, first of all, the Bush administration and the United States for the, the period of uh, both the second Reagan term and the Bush administration that followed it, found in the reforming Soviet Union of Mikhail Gorbachev, a partner with increasingly important uh, capabilities to first bring a cold, the Cold War to an end, which they did actually through negotiation in many ways before the Soviet Union collapsed. And then uh, as a partner, they, they be believed and I think uh, were committed to seeking uh, the means to, to develop as a new partner in that part of the world, in Eurasia, that was going to manage the uh, reduction of nuclear arms, uh, a peaceful transition in, in uh, what had been the Warsaw Pact region, and I just think probably also uh, had sense that the socio-political economic order in the Soviet Union itself was evolving in a way that was constructive. And so they, they had a stake, I think, uh, I think they would agree. They had a stake in Gorbachev and in what he stood for and what he was trying to do. They also knew that the resistance to his changes was growing. And uh, even before the coup, it was pretty clear uh, that, you know, the, the, the changes that Gorbachev was pushing were increasingly being resisted, particularly as they began to affect who controlled what resources, who controlled uh, authority, was it going to be devolved more to the republics to Ukraine, to Kazakhstan, so, or was it going to continue to be highly centralized? And the Communist Party hardliners, the, 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 the real Bolsheviks, really were resisting what Gorbachev was trying to suggest. And in fact, the coup came about because he had managed the negotiation of a new, essentially, constitution for the Union that gave much more authority and much more control to the republic, local, regional governments. And the hardline communists simply were resisting that. But we thought, I think, fair, quite simply, that it was moving in the right direction and that Gorbachev had demonstrated that he was prepared to see a, an orderly devolution of the system of the old Warsaw Pact, of the European order, into something new that in which the Soviet Union could be a constructive player, or at least a, a partner on whom we could count. Uh, and in that sense, they felt a stake in the Soviet Union surviving. This was, I think, the origin of the famous speech in Kiev in July of 91, or I guess the beginning of August 91 which was very much criticized, or for which President Bush was very much criticized. But it was saying, in essence, to the uh, nationalist movements, to the, to the movements trying to break up uh, or challenge the authority of Moscow, be careful, take your time. Um, not a popular message at the moment for, for the nationalists, but one which I think was genuinely felt. You mentioned, of course, Boris Yeltsin, who's one of the main characters at this point in Russian history, at that point. Um, 
you and when you arrived in 1997, which is when I arrived in Moscow as a bureau chief in 97, Yeltsin, I remember so many times being called back from little breaks that I would take that Yeltsin was either uh, dying, <laughs> he died yeah. many times, or uh, he had fired yet another prime minister. But it was a very tumultuous time in that, that 97, 98 period. Um, why was it so tumultuous? Was it the time? Uh, was it Yeltsin himself? And could you give me, you know, some of the impressions that you had? Because obviously you met him and you were watching him very closely. What kind of a man was he? What kind of a leader? Well, I think let's take the, let's take Yeltsin first. Um, I happen to be a, a man, as someone who has the greatest respect and uh, for him, and believe he will go down in history as one of the the truly great leaders of a society. Now, I think it's true of Gorbachev as well, because both of them were in the business of managing extraordinary upheaval and change in a society that had been a very, very disciplined totalitarian structure uh, and converting it into something that was far more open and unable to isolate itself any longer from the rest of the world. And the impact, impact of this across the society and on the structures and everything else, that everyone who lived in the Soviet Union, uh, in the, even in the early 80s, took for granted, simply was uh, something Americans can't possibly imagine. And so as they managed the changes, I mean, Gorbachev was trying to control it to preserve the Soviet Union, frankly and to convert it into something that was a modernized, more open economy, uh, more structured in a way to uh, allow uh, control of the region, but in a way that would uh, develop its economy and so on. Yeltsin was, uh, was different. Yeltsin had, uh, uh, I think, for all sorts of reasons, decided he couldn't stand the Communist Party. He wanted to see it out of more power. Um, the party had tried to destroy him, and it was a mutually um, a mutually understood uh, position of what they were all each about. Um, and in es in essence, what he did, it seems to me, was re revolutionize Russia in in three basic ways. Um, the first political one, which I think was extraordinary, and very few people give him credit for this, but it's a reality, is that he truly established that the only legitimate political authority for any future Russian leader or person claiming political authority was going to be having been elected. There was no bloodline that entitled you to, to authority. And there was no party or, if you will, theology that gave you authority. You were no priesthood that claimed authority by anything but the acceptance of the public. And so that has survived, even though we have all sorts of arguments about how free or not free the elections are in Russia or all the time. The fact of the matter is Mr. Putin cannot claim legitimacy except by being elected. And so he's got to figure out a way to do that. Now, you know, we can argue about whether he's very much of a Democrat in the way he carries out his elections, but he has no other way of legitimating his authority. The other was Yeltsin uh, was committed to opening up the country to the rest of the world. He essentially threw it open to the outside world. And he ended the effort to control, if you will, the, the Russian or previously Soviet information space. Now it was already uh, uh, a reality that you couldn't control it as you had before. We were seeing the beginnings of the cell phone, the internet was just beginning and so forth, but he opened it up. And I remember being in a room with him one day uh, with the Swedish ambassador, maybe oh, in 98 or so, uh, 
And we watched a little man, a man with a little box in the corner of this room about the size of my living room, throw a switch on a box and it opened up 64,000 telephone lines to the outside world, direct dial lines. There had only been a few hundred before open to the public. This was the beginning. This was sort of symbolic of what was happening. And people, you know, people were uh, from the outside were pouring in. People from Russia were traveling abroad like never before. And so he opened the country to the outside world, and he made Russia at this point an integrated part of the global financial economic system. And I would argue the information system and the world's political system. There, where it could no longer isolate itself from uh, what uh, the rest of the world was doing or create this alternative universe that the communists had managed to do for most of the 20th century. And then thirdly, he also accepted something that no Russian ruler in centuries had even thought about, which was ending empire. That the direct rule by Moscow of all of these other republics simply was not going to be tenable. And over the time, first of all, he announced that was the case. He and, and the others, when they came, uh, the, the president of Belarus and the president of Ukraine, when they agreed the Soviet Union would no longer be a central centralized controlled government. He carried it further and over his tenure, he negotiated the border treaties and other kinds of issues with all of the other new states that emerged from the collapse of the Soviet Union and said they will be accepted as independent states. Now, that was a complete revolution for Eurasia as a whole, not just the Soviet Union, not just Russia. Uh, it was now market economics. They were integrated in our global system. It was an open part of a Euro-Atlantic community, and it was no longer an imperial system. Now, that was a pretty big set of reforms uh, for someone to undertake or to carry out in, a, in the period of a decade. And I think most significantly also from the standpoint of, of Washington, he did two things that in, in accomplishing these objectives that were very important. First, there was no major bloodshed. There were plenty of people who worried that we were in for an Eurasian scale Balkans. And it never happened. And, and in great part, it did not happen because Yeltsin himself and some of the other key leaders were determined it would not happen. And there were plenty of reasons it could have fallen apart. And the second thing he did, it seems to me, that was of absolutely critical importance to us was he worked with us to manage the nuclear issue, to bring all of the nuclear weaponry uh, in uh, the former Soviet space back into the Russian Federation, and then to pursue the reduction in the amounts of it in a way that essentially probably uh, permitted us to say we have managed to come to terms on our single most critical objective with uh, Moscow. That was the control and reduction of the nuclear arsenal. And that was, believe me, in the first half of the 90s was our key priority and the one that we couldn't be sure was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Yeltsin deserves, it seems to me, a tremendous amount of credit for leading a process that made it possible for Russians to have breathing space and to allow themselves to recover without immense pressures from the outside or the challenges of violence at home. That could have really made a very different 1990s. And given uh, the end of it made the end of his tenure look very different from what it in fact was when he left. And speaking of which, a um, couple of years after you are there, we're into the end of 1999. Uh, Vladimir Putin comes on the scene rather unexpectedly. Nobody quite 
knows who he is, at least on the outside. He becomes a uh, prime minister for President uh, Yeltsin. And then, surprise, at the end of 1999, Yeltsin steps aside and names Putin as his heir. And then we have the election in March of 2000. Mm -hmm. So with Putin, can you, I know it's a big subject, but you obviously watched that, you've talked with him many times, you've seen him up close. What was the change? What was, what was Putin like at the beginning of his uh, tenure as president, just as he came in? Well, I think um, it's important to say a word or two about what Putin thought he was inheriting. Um, he, uh, if we look at the last years of the Yeltsin tenure from 98, 99 to those two years, they were tumultuous years. And there were two particular events that I think um, shaped a great deal of the environment in which uh, Yeltsin, first of all, decided totally unexpectedly by almost anyone in Moscow I talked to that he would step down from his presidency six months early. Most of the speculation in Moscow was how was he going to hold on? How is he going to go for another term? Almost nobody thought he was going to give it up. And when he gave it up six months early, it was a shock. But it also reflected his own understanding, I think, or his own sense that he was almost in an untenable position because his popularity had sunk to the lowest possible degree. Uh, he was really almost uh, unable to, to govern effectively. And um, he was suffering the reason, the, I would say the fallout from two critical issues. Uh, one was the financial collapse in the late summer of 1998, which was a tremendous blow to all Russians, essentially. Whatever thoughts of recovery and uh, uh, return to something like a new order had uh, emerged during the mid-90s seemed to go up in smoke with the financial collapse. And uh, it was also the moment, I think, which was critical for Russia's relations with Washington and, and uh, Europe, because suddenly the Russia's economic transformation seemed not to be working, or Russia seemed to be turning away from responsibility. And I remember very well that the, uh, the press in the United States at that time, in August 98, turned from seeing Russia as a great success story for us to who was guilty, you know, who, who, who failed. Who lost Russia started to emerge? Well, I mean, the idea that we had Russia to begin with was kind of nutty, but you know, the, the idea was everything had been going fine until somebody made a huge mistake or somebody was so engaged in malfeasance that the Russian economy uh, defaulted, couldn't pay its debts, was, uh, uh, and so forth. Now, at that time in Moscow, what I remember most, and you may remember this too, Jill, was how absolutely paranoid the entire elite was at what might happen as a result of the collapse of the ruble and the collapse of the economy. And I remember very well talking to, I, I remember visiting the uh, head of two unions in the coal industry. One was the private union, one was the official sort of state-sanctioned union. Both of them absolutely uh, beside themselves that the miners might basically explode, rebel. Uh, and there were steps. I mean, there were miners in, uh, in uh, one of the great coal field areas putting blocking trail train traffic 
and so forth. And so there was a real worry that the, there was going to be a huge uprising and chaos. And everybody from the farthest right to the farthest left in the political spectrum in Moscow at that time was out trying to keep a lid on things. I remember this was the serious business. It also so it had one effect that I think was unfortunate because uh, he, uh, Yeltsin had named a man named Kirienka at that time to be his prime minister. He'd done this some months before. And Kirienka was a very savvy, very intelligent man. Um, he was, again, one of the younger generation people that Yeltsin kept turning to to try to bring the system along. And he was a victim of this collapse because, you know, it happened on his watch. He'd only been there about six, seven months and he, and he was responsible for the collapse. And so uh, the, the recovery from the economic collapse or keeping it under control was something that weakened uh, Yeltsin a lot, uh, what happened from it. And I think that was a major problem. And it was also a setback for what I would say was the reformist agenda. Because the question was, well, who's to kill it? Who's to blame? And you could pick your, pick your best candidate. It would, could be the Americans. It could be uh, Anatoly Chubais. It could be Yeltsin. But it was almost never the people who were the conservatives or the people who were the nationalists, the people who were the critics of the reform people. So the reformers got it a bad name for that, and Yeltsin with them. And the second event that I think was also traumatic uh, and damaged the Yeltsin team a lot was the Kosovo conflict. Um, this had to do with what was happening in Serbia and the Serbs' effort to stop the Kosovars and, and uh, the war in Serbia, basically, in which we ultimately intervened militarily by bombing Belgrade. Now, the, the result of that uh, for Yeltsin was also a, uh, a major setback. Uh, he had sought to keep us from any military intervention in Serbia uh, unsuccessfully. Um, and the result was essentially the most uh, profound uh, turn against Yeltsin and the Americans that I remember or, or experienced. It went deeper even than the economic issue. Um, and it went far down uh, and became a cause for all of those critics of Yeltsin and the reform process and those who thought that you know, Yeltsin had uh, done away with Russian greatness and the Soviet system and all this kind of thing. It gave them their first real opportunity to have a popular cause, that the Americans were bombing their little Serbian brothers. And that was a very profound and deep uh, uh, emotion in, in the public. And I remember for two, three weeks, it was pretty tense. And Yeltsin was on the defensive. Yeah, he, he was continually trying to figure out how to do it. He joined in the criticism of the Americans and of the people who had allowed this to happen. And what he said essentially was, you know, this is unacceptable. And he got himself out of it essentially by uh, appointing his former prime minister, Chernomirdin, to be an envoy to try to stop the fighting in Serbia. And then uh, turning uh, his gaze on the critics as warmongers and people trying to drag the Russian side into a war with the United States, which he said he would never allow. Well, I mean, you know, it was pretty effective, actually, and, and the war did come to a halt and so forth. But uh, it left well, Yeltsin again weakened, it seemed to me. And so by the time we go into two, the uh, late, later 99, Yeltsin, is, uh, his ratings are, you know, 5% or something, I mean, to the extent you could believe any of this, um, and so forth. 
And um, in the period of all this, or in the, the process of all this, um, he um, found that uh, he needed to move away from uh, his crisis prime minister, Primakov, and he uh, ended up picking uh, Mr. Putin to take his place and to become the new prime minister. Um, now, Putin was not unknown in the Kremlin, but he wasn't very well known by, by most on the outside. I had dealt with him personally when he was the head of the security service, uh, and which he was under Yeltsin for a time. Uh, he had been uh, the national security advisor for a time. And uh, then he became prime minister. And so um, he was in the position, essentially, which constitutionally was, of course, the one to succeed the president, should the president in any way be incapacitated or, or not be able to discharge his duties or resign. But as I said, the, the critical point was that nobody at the late 99 thought that President Yeltsin was going anywhere. They all assumed he was going to hang on. So that Putin was, you know, another guy in a job. Uh, he'd be gone in a while, too, and, and it wasn't. Fun. And so when, when, uh, when President Yeltsin resigned, totally unexpectedly, on New Year's Eve, 99-2000, uh, it was a shock. People did not expect it. You probably remember this pretty well. And uh, we suddenly had acting President Putin. And the reality was um, most people didn't know much about him. Not very many people had worked with him at all. Uh, I had, I won't say I knew him well, but I had dealt with him in different ways uh, over the two years, last two years of my time there. And uh, I found him, uh, first of all, very intelligent, always well briefed, never used notes in a conversation with me. Um, I found him uh, interesting because unlike President Yeltsin, who more or less pronounced in a, in a meeting, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Putin would discuss things with you. You would have questions and answers and discussions. And so it was a different kind of person. And then, of course, he was young. He was vigorous. He was, you know, uh, sort of the next generation. Uh, in that sense, he fit Yeltsin's mold. Yeltsin never wanted his generation to succeed. Him. He wanted the younger people to do it. And so you had this new, rather unknown man coming in to become acting president. And for the first four or five months, uh, he was there in an acting capacity, uh, had to get himself elected. And so he was waging uh, an election campaign as well as uh, performing the duties of president in that first period. Now, there were a few things that I thought were interesting about him um, uh, in that period. One was, I remember very well, he. He, his first meeting with Secretary Albright. And while I'm not going to get into the details of everything that was discussed, one thing was very interesting to me. He said, in essence, uh, to her, and this was, I think, in February, and I don't remember exactly how the question came up, but he said, you know, um, I do karate, and I like Chinese food, but that's not who we are. You know, we are a part of Europe. We are European. That is our culture. That is where we look. And so I may have arrangements with China or Japan or Asia, but we are part of Europe. And I thought it was interesting because it was a reaffirmation of, you know, in a sense, the idea that Russia saw its future as linked into Europe and the Euro-Atlantic world. That was what he was saying. So he was not challenging, in a sense, the, the premise that Russia belonged into that larger family. 
well, I'd say the Euro-Atlantic. And so that was one thing I remembered very much. And I think it was a, a reassuring moment in some ways. There was another event, however, that was of a different kind. And I think uh, in retrospect should have given us pause and given uh, attracted greater attention than it ever did. And this was an event in the Kremlin in, uh, on what is called Old New Year's Day. Uh, at the big palace of congresses, the huge amphitheater in which they used to hold their Communist Party congresses. And it was an evening event, a very Russian type event, and what I always called sort of homily and Ed Sullivan show. But it was, it was the theme that I thought was important because the sponsor was the patriarch and the participants were Primakov, the former prime minister, foreign minister, Mr. Zuganov, who was the head of the uh, sort of new nationalist populist party, the so misnamed, misnamed Liberal Democratic Party, and Mr. Zuganov, who was the head of the Communist Party. And the theme of the evening was all about what makes Russia great. And the, the, the author that was cited was the early Slavophile, a man named Komyakov. And the theme of the evening was what makes Russia great and by implication, what causes our decline. And so there were four or five different segments, four segments, I think, and each of these four men spoke um, extolling the different things that made Russia great, according to Komyakov. One was its morals, one was beauty uh, and so forth. Uh, another was faith, the Orthodox faith. And essentially, this was all about the theme of when we are together, we are great. And when we are uh, at each other's throats, we are weak. And so um, the theme by the end of the evening said, I have, and this was in the name of Putin, in a way, the new order. We have a big tent. Everybody un is welcome under it. And we are going to make Russia great again, to coin a phrase. And the theme on which it's going to be based is unity. If you're with us and you're with me in seeking this objective, you will be welcome and we will find ways to use all that you can contribute. But if you oppose us, then you will be outside the tent and you will have, by implication, a very difficult time as someone seeking Russia's weakness. Well, we didn't, I think, fully understand what that was all about. I mean, we did then get Yadina Yarosia, United Russia, uh, flowed out of that, uh, what amounted to the new party. And we then saw uh, some of the early steps that Putin took in a way to deliver on. And you may remember, uh, Russia had a national anthem, but it couldn't have any words. Um, well, he figured out how to deal with that. He kept, took the old Soviet anthem and gave it new words. That satisfied both sides of the, the fight under Yeltsin. Uh, the flag was a problem because the military wanted to preserve the flag of World War II, the Soviet battle flag. And the, the uh, Yeltsin reformist people had all put up the new tricolor, the Petrine flag. Well, he said, fine, we're going to use the Petrine flag as the national flag, but the military can keep its battle flag. And there were a variety of different things like that, where he tried to unite the emotional and emotions of the two sides that were divided under the Yeltsin period and bring them under one tent. And the few people who tended to be in opposition, including some who were running against him as president in his campaign, found themselves in difficult straits. So, you know, Mr. Gusinski was jailed for a time and ultimately exiled. Uh, he was a media mogul, uh, someone who had actually a self-made man in most respects, who had created the, the one really independent television network. And it was uh, taken away from him in essence, and he was exiled for opposing uh, many of the things Mr. Putin was doing. Uh, later on, Mr. Berezovsky uh, met the same 
But fundamentally, the steps that Mr. Putin took both in that early time and then in his first year as I was there, were in many ways directed at uniting the country, pulling the country together, uh, creating uh, conditions that were for the most part welcomed by people like the business community, uh, most of the people who had been reformers thought they were positive. So he, <coughs> excuse me, he essentially moved, for instance, to have uh, the rule of law uniform across the country. So that if you signed a contract in St. Petersburg, it would be honored in Vladivostok, something that hadn't been the case for most of the 90s. He brought about in this early period a series of legal reforms. <clears throat> that He reformed the criminal judicial code that freed thousands of people from, um, uh, from uh, preventive detention and so forth. So there were many reasons that people saw him as a constructive uh, implementer in many ways of many of the reform <clears throat> uh, reforms on the agenda that Mr. Yeltsin had put forth that he was never able to accomplish in that first year. Now, I think in retrospect, you know, uh, it's perfectly clear that there were two sides to all of this. On the one hand, there was the the unity side that didn't see a lot of room for people who were going to oppose the changes. On the other hand, the changes that were being made were rather more than not consistent with the kinds of reforms that everybody had wanted to see in Yeltsin's second term, but Yeltsin couldn't get through. And so as I left in, at the end of, you know, in the mid, middle of 2001, I think, you know, the, the returns were out, really, on, on Mr. Putin. Where was he going? What was he going to do? <clears throat> and I think that, you know, that, that lasted for considerable time. And um, I guess what I would say, uh, finally, in, in one respect, is that I thought a major point in our relations with him took place in 2001 after 9-11. When, as you may recall, he was the first to call President Bush and uh, express his support and condolences. And then he came to the United States uh, in, I think it was November of 2001. And if you go back and look at what he said with us and said jointly and documents he signed on to at that time, you would have thought we had a major opportunity to develop a new kind of relationship of, of uh, that would be cooperative and productive, albeit with problems, but it was the issues were, were not, I would say, uh, 180 degrees opposite. And we lost that opportunity, I think, uh, when we decided uh, we had other priorities and we were not going to pursue it. And I think we lost an opportunity. I don't know where it would have taken us. And I think it's, uh, it's unknown what might have been possible with Mr. Putin um, had we pursued a different kind of relations with him. But uh, the Bush administration, for whatever reason, decided that they uh, were not going to attach particular priority to relations with Russia, and that uh, we had other major uh, issues, and that uh, Russia was not a major factor for us going forward. And I think we paid a price for that. You know, there are some people who believe that there is uh, Putin one and Putin two. And it, you're kind of alluding to that in a way that there was this belief that he was a reformer and that relations could improve and all of that. And yet we're faced right now with a, a much more controlled environment in Russia legally uh, and, and every other way internationally. So do you believe that there was some sort of turning point where Putin 
changed or was that his plan all along? Well, I think it's it's sort of impossible to tell. I, I do think that we probably underestimated the importance of that meeting in the Palace of Congresses and what it suggested about the kind of Russia Mr. Putin and the people around him thought you needed to have. And I think there was no question that it was uh, a kind of Russia where uh, unity was defined as having relatively circumscribed uh, possibilities for dissenting views or alternative views about priorities or, or ways in which things would be done. So I think um, there was certainly that dimension to this that was very significant and was was seen as important. And I think what one of the reasons Putin focused on that right from the beginning was he watched in the 90s as the presidency, uh, Yeltsin's presidency, would go up and down and up and down as people uh, would he, he'd make a decision that was very successful and then people would chip away at him and it would uh, the criticism would grow and he'd be down again and then something would happen and he'd be up again because he you know took it took it up. but the presidency was never I think um, from a, the point of view of someone like the, the Putin people I think the, he they felt they had to have a steady, high-rated presidency, one that was respected, one that was authoritative, not one that anyone could disrespect. And so you, I think the idea to preserve that or create that presidency and then preserve it against all comers was quite strong. And I think that was sort of behind the message of that Palace of Congress's meeting. Um, now, the implications of that were pretty serious, I think, if you play them out. Uh, you, you know, this didn't mean that we had exactly someone who was a Jeffersonian Democrat uh, coming into authority. On the other hand, as I said, uh, he did some rather remarkable things in his, his early period while I was there and in, uh, in, well into 2001. Um, uh, one of the things that was remarkable, I think, in a sort of negative sense, was the Chechnya, the Second Chechnya War, which um, he he finally brought to an end with a with a deal, essentially, and it has held. You haven't had another Chechnya War, but it was brutal, and basically, what it did was turn the region over to uh, what amounts to a pretty awful leader. Uh, as uh, and give him control. Um, I also, but at the same time, we we had a lot of changes that were quite constructive. You know, as I said, things that had been on the Yeltsin agenda and could not get done under Yeltsin, and Putin brought them about, and he did it by pulling people together, by pulling the, the country together, uh, cutting the deals that were necessary. In many ways, presiding over what I always saw as a sort of series of groupings that he had to bring together and get to uh, accept the certain changes or certain directions he was setting. Uh, this was the military, the security services, the economic oligarchy, the regional elites, the bureaucracy, the, the intelligentsia, and so on. All of them had these groups, and he kind of sat above them trying to orchestrate their the way they would be brought together to buy into whatever the next step was. But he was far from having, uh, you know, uh, I would say the kind of authority that people impute to him today <clears throat> at that point. He was really presiding over and managing uh, a complex political process that uh, took a lot of a lot of skill. <clears throat> I think where that changed, and I do think there is a 
a, a change was really at the uh, at, at the period in which he begins to run for re-election for the second term. And in that uh, in that period, uh, you have the famous arrest of Mr. Khodorkovsky, um, which was a signal in a sense that actual and real opposition was going to be a dangerous thing to undertake. And I think more to the point, as I watched it, what it meant was that he turned more and more to his colleagues in the security services as the one element in that whole panoply of different groupings that had not really had a very good place in the Yeltsin period or had, had not been able to prosper in the Elson period. And he turned to them essentially to ensure that things went right in the election in 2004. And that, I think after that, it was a very different world. Uh, the, the security service people at that point began to be discussed as the ones who were the critical players for him and on whom he's depending. Mm -hmm. And Okay, was that his plan at the beginning? Was it the way he operated from the beginning? The security services certainly had a new role from the, almost from the outset with Mr. Putin. But they didn't have the same kind of position that they came to have uh, as the second term unfolded. And I think in that sense, there's a difference. You know, Mr. Ambassador, all of this is really fascinating to me to think of you let's say, over your career, but, but also sitting in the embassy when you were the ambassador and previous times and trying to uh, kind of like what your wife was referring to, to understand in the midst of breaking news and events and confusing events, um, to figure out where is this all going? And I know you um, studied history. In fact, your graduate work was in Russian history. You taught it at the U.S. Naval Academy, I believe. And so there you are, and here you are now, and trying to understand that country, which is obviously very complex. How does your historical sense affect your understanding of Russia? And then do you see new factors that you have to take into consideration to understand what's going on? Well, I think um, if I look back on it, one of the things I would say that was, was certainly a part of the way I approached the, the country <clears throat> um, was that this was not suddenly the United States after 1991. And there was a lot of, I think, peculiar thinking in, in the United States about what had happened in the Soviet Union in that period of the, the transformation. Um, you know, Russia is a thousand, a thousand, more than a thousand years old. It's, it's a huge country. It has had a complex and, and rich history. It has, uh, it has peculiarities that have beset every Russian ruler uh, in terms of issues that he, that person has to solve. And I thought none of those things changed, really. Uh, what changed was how people decided they were gonna try it this time. But the reality was that Russia remained uh, a child of its past and of its, of its possibilities and of its geography. And therefore, you, you couldn't assume that uh, all of that was simply going to go away. Now, I think there were a few things that, that I, I took away uh, from that that uh, many in Washington, I don't think, ever understood or and still don't, frankly. I mean, uh, one is that uh, the Russian... Uh, approach to its existence is always predicated on the fact that it's huge. Governing it is tremendously difficult. Uh, it has no natural borders. Uh, managing its economy and its resources is always a challenge because it has fewer people than it has resources. And so how do you deal with that? 
Um, how do you develop its its people and its its resources in anything like um, a modern way? And always uh, seemingly in a context where Russia is behind or senses that it's behind. Now, you know, Russian rulers have dealt with that issue for a thousand years. The Soviets were always dealing with it. And Mr. Putin today is no different. I mean, he is uh, playing a weak hand, essentially, and a complicated hand. And he's trying to deal with these questions. How do I secure a country with no borders that are not, that are net natural? How do I manage uh, the ec economic rules for a country that is, I guess it's nine time zones uh, in size today. It was 11 when I was there. How do you uh, get decisions made that are going to be uniformly applicable and what's the relationship between those and the, with the local needs uh, differences, say, in Kamchatka in the Far East from St. Petersburg uh, on the Baltic? So all of these things are there, and they are challenges for any Russian leader, and Russian leaders have tried to deal with them in different ways. Uh, and usually it has been, in the Russian sense, uh, a way in which the central authority tries to uh, manage things in more detail probably than we uh, in the United States have ever thought. I think another thing that has always been true is that Americans, when faced with labor shortage, as we were in, in much of our country, uh, in terms of the resources we had, uh, turned to machines. The Russian pattern uh, almost all of its history, not all, but most of it, had been to bind labor to the thing that produced, whether it was land or factories or whatever. So you had serfdom, and then you had what in the communist system, what amounted to, in a sense, tying the worker to his job. It's where he got his home, it's where he got his education, it's where he got so forth. And you couldn't move around in the country in the, in the way. In the modern system, this is an unknown quantity. And, you know, there the the disparity between labor available and resources to be exploited is huge. There's a labor shortage, and the population issue is a major one. So, Mr. Putin is trying to deal with these issues in his own way, as all of his predecessors have tried. Now, you know, this gives you a different perspective. Similarly, um, we've never been invaded, but the Russian people have lived under invasion or been invaded or lived under foreign authority, at least in major parts, for generations, if not centuries in its history. That is also something that makes leaves its mark. And so how do you defend and how do you provide security for a country in the geography and geographic circumstances and economic circumstances that uh, Russia finds itself. And not too surprisingly, a major part of that has to be to <clears throat> try to ensure that anybody to invade the, the heart of Russia has to go a long ways to get there before they make it. And hence, uh, you know, you had these this obsession with uh, what I suppose you'd call defense in depth geographic. Uh, today we're talking about a sphere of influence, but I mean, fundamentally, this is not a new, uh, this is one way of resolving a very old problem in, in a sense. Uh, and we don't happen to agree with that solution, but that's the way. So I think, you know, his, my historical sense uh, from having been there as a student in the 60s, uh, in the 70s, when I was at the embassy in a different, very different age, you know, simply gave me an appreciation for the fact that this is a country with major challenges and problems and a tradition and history of resolving them in ways that are not quite consistent with the American way of doing it. And so we have to have a certain understanding of that and try to figure out where you can where you can put things 
uh, together as two major societies or as two cultures in ways that will work uh, constructively for both of us. So, I mean, you know, if we face the issue, for instance, today of climate, what are, what are we going to do? Because the views about what's good in the climate uh, or in climate change may be quite different in Russia from what they are here. And yet we both face that issue. How are we going to deal with it? I don't know. If this is a priority, however, it ought to be getting attention for, for the two governments. We'll see. No, um, you and I have known each other actually now for quite a long time. And in your post-diplomatic uh, serving career, you have become very active in both think tanks at Carnegie and then in organizations, let's say, uh, track two diplomatic groups that have worked to uh, keep the relationship going, to improve the relationship. I'm thinking uh, just one is the Dartmouth, Dartmouth discussion group uh, that meets with Russian colleagues. So you've really devoted a lot of the, your time to these organizations. Do you think that they do have an effect? And if so, what is it? What, what can those organizations that, that are not specifically government do to keep this relationship on track? Well, first of all, I don't overestimate them in any way. I mean, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, the, the, the major institutions that define our relations at any given time are, first of all, our governments. Uh, secondly, I think probably our economic relations, that is fundamentally the, the relations between our major economic entities, uh, however you want to define them. But I do think that uh, the engagement of the societies uh, at a variety of levels and in different ways is also important. Um, it's not the kind of I would say, or let's put the, any given uh, organization or program probably has much less impact today than it did in the worst of the Cold War era. When any Soviet citizen meeting any citizen from the United States was an oddity and was a unique thing. But that's not true today. Today, Russia is part of our information space, as we're learning in many ways, not always <laughs> do the best. Uh, Russians are free to travel. Uh, Russians do know a lot about the outside world in, in ways that 35 years ago were unimaginable. And so we're dealing in that sense in a different context. But, <clears throat> but that said, it seems to me the reason I've stuck with this is that sooner or later, the the two countries have certain kinds of interests in common. Um, it's important also for them to understand where we have interests that aren't in common. And I think the, the discussion among different kinds of organizations and groups and citizens and so forth helps uh, diversify the sort of idea that there's only a uh, a one-dimensional relationship, which is between our governments and the contests that we're having um, in today, which where our relations are pretty bad. I, it seems to me that uh, it's particularly important, for instance, for us to focus on younger people. Um, what's the next generation going to think about? Um, I've been involved with a young generation group that has about 100 members from 28 countries that meets now Zooming all the time. So, and, and it brings the Russians into a group that rep has representation from most of the Euro-Atlantic world. Um, I think it's important for us to uh, hear the other side out. I may not agree with them, uh, may find some of their views peculiar, I'm sure they think the same, but uh, keeping these contacts alive at different levels and through different ways means that 
when opportunities arise, maybe you will be able to develop something new. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I also believe it's terribly important to keep these things alive because we had a huge uh, program of exchanges and education and so forth in the 90s. And thousands and thousands of, of younger Russian people came. Uh, and Americans went there. Well, all those people are now 30 years older. And some of them who were 45 are history. You know, they're like me, they're living history. Well, you need to keep replenishing that loop. You need to keep encouraging the idea that the two societies have to continue to talk to one another. And I think in that sense, that's why I've stayed with it. I think it's important. I think, do I think it resolves issues? Probably not. Um, does it contribute perhaps to the thinking about how people will view ways to resolve issues? Perhaps. But uh, the key thing is that Russia today is an open society. Uh, it, is, it is not isolated. It is not divorced from the rest of this information world we live in. And so we need to be sure that uh, the views, uh, the, the variety of views from the outside play their role in people's thinking in Russia. And I think that's important. And that's why I've continued to push this. Yes, Dr. Collins, we just have a few minutes left. So this will be my last yeah. question. But I think it's important. What would you recommend to the next ambassador to Russia and ones in history looking down at the future? What would you recommend? What is the most important thing that they should keep in mind based on your own experience? Well, I guess uh, there are two or three things that I think are very important at this point. I mean, I it seems to me that a critical issue for any ambassador going out uh, at this point, and one I would hope he would resolve before he ever gets to Moscow, is what are we seeking to accomplish with the Russian Federation? And I don't mean just the list of demands that we keep putting up, but what kind of relationship would we see as the objective we're trying to build? You know, what, what would it look like? How would we know when we have it? We're not going to agree on everything. We're not going to have a world in which there are no differences. So what is the right kind of relationship that would meet American interests and probably have to meet Russian interests to be stable and uh, enduring? And I think any ambassador appointed or anyone appointed to be ambassador to go out ought to insist he needs to know what the president's view about that is. Because if he doesn't have that sense, he doesn't know what he's trying to accomplish. He will have a laundry list of things to do, but he will have no sense of priorities, believe me, from Washington. Because Washington will have as many priorities as today's headlines. Uh, so you have to have a way to understand what your, your prayers. Now, I was fortunate when I went out that I had that. I, had an, I was able to have a pretty clear agenda about what our objectives were and what kind of relationship people were trying to build with the Russian Federation. So I, was, I, was, I thought I was lucky in that regard. Uh, and it helped me to organize the embassy. The second thing I'd say is, if you have that, then you have to make the most of the assets you have in your mission. Uh, you know, uh, what I found, uh, what I, a man for whom I had the greatest possible respect and for whom I worked was not actually a Russian hand. He was, he was a Near East expert and, and uh, assistant secretary for Near East Affairs when I worked for him. His name was Hal Saunders. Hal Saunders was uh, an extraordinary diplomat and manager of bureaucratic work. And he knew how to bring together all the pieces of the government to go after a certain objective. 
And I learned a lot of that from him. And that's what I tried to do when I went to Moscow. So my, my second thing I think would say to your ambassador is be sure that all of your pieces in the embassy know what the objectives are, trust them to contribute to them as they can, and assume that you uh, have a very talented and good group to work with. Uh, if you do, you'll, you'll get there. And I think the third thing I would say is uh, you are going to a country with a complex, rich, difficult history, uh, a culture that sees many things differently from ours. Understand that. Uh, Washington can only prosper in its objectives when you can explain to them how to get something done with this culture, which is different. Uh, so you need to explain Moscow to Washington and you need to explain Washington to Moscow. And I think that was uh, a very important part of the job. Certainly promoting American interests and so forth was the key. But how you could do that most as an ambassador was essentially to be very effective in finding the places you could use commonality to move something ahead, as opposed to focusing on what divided us. And that was probably important. Wonderful. Uh, I've always enjoyed and really benefited from what you have said over the years. And thank you very much, Ambassador James Collins. Really appreciate you talking with us. Jill, thank you so much. It's been a great opportunity and I really appreciate it.